We all love a good story, and we are writing and living out the story of our lives. But did you know there's a bigger story going on? And Jerry's going to be talking about that right now. Right, so when they're making a movie, um, and in particular the recording of the soundtrack of the movie, if you've ever been um, had the opportunity to be on a soundstage or to see behind the scenes how they make a movie, uh, basically like you guys would be the, the orchestra, uh, and I'm a conductor facing, um, and on the, but on the back wall back there that would be to your backs if you're the orchestra, um, they have the actual scenes being played out. So they film the scenes, they've got all this, you're the orchestra, uh, but the conductor can see what's happening. And so he's directing the, the, the sounds to come in at certain times and all of these kinds of things. And that's how they, they put together a soundtrack. And, and you think of, of that, and sometimes th there are movies that sh you, know, you don't even remember that it had any music playing in the background, but then there's other movies that, uh, that, that really kind of show the impact of music on, on the movies, and, and not even musicals. Um, we, uh, uh, I, was, I was trying to think of some of the obvious ones, and some of these are going to be very dated because I'm a lot older than some of you, and, uh, but uh, the, the sound of music when that, that thing would swell up and the hills are alive and, and all of that kind of thing, and they would do that. Uh, do you remember the first time you, you saw uh, the movie Jaws and you heard the soundtrack? Just done, done, you go, oh man, that's it. You know, it was already over uh, before it even got into that part. Uh, the new Top Gun is out, but, but remember the old Top Gun with uh, Danger Zone and then you've lost that love and feeling. I mean, the, the sound in the movies, all, I mean, we're off to see the wizard, right? I mean, uh, all, this, all this impact that music has had on movies. And I think it's the soundtrack then of the movie that really brings it to life. And uh, it really helps us to remember the things that are going on. Uh, the story that we're going to be talking about this summer, the never ending story, as the uh, video intro just showed, uh, is the story of God. And I think the soundtrack of the story of God is the worship of the people of God. Uh, before you can have a song, there has to be a story. And, and before there's a musical story, Store, uh, score, there's the drama that's unfolding and the story that's going on around us every single day is the story of God. And as someone has said, it's the greatest story that's ever been told and is still being told. As we see it unfold and as we watch what God does and, 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 and how he does things, we begin to understand who God really is. Um, and a song begins to form in our heart and that music in the hearts of the people of God, and our lives become that soundtrack to the story of God. So there's this huge story going on, and God is orchestrating it, and, and, and you and I only see a little part of it at a time, but God is inviting each of us to find our place in his story. And everything is the story of God. Scripture says that he is before all things, that he is through all things, that he is at the end of all things, that he is the reason for all things. He's the originator for all things. All things are ultimately about him. He's the giver of all things, the sustainer of all things. History is about him. Science is about him. Eternity is about him. Creation is about him. The church is about him. You are about him. I am about him. Heaven is about him. Our scriptures that we have are all about him. Everything that exists is about God. Everything is the story of God. And you and I need to realize today that each of our stories are in the middle of God's never-ending story. In fact, I think the greatest thing that can happen to anyone is, is the time that they wake up to realize that they're a part of this huge story, and, and it's not even about us. We're not even the star in this story. The greatest thing that ever happened to me was the day that I realized that it was not all about me, but that it was all about God. And let me say this, I was already a Christian when I woke up to that truth. 
I became a believer when I was just a little guy. And, and I think that little guys can understand that Jesus came to die for their sins, but I also think you've got to be a little bit older before you fully wake up and say, oh, wow. I mean, my story is just this size, but I'm living in the middle of this massive story of God. And now every day you and I are faced with a choice. Do we want to keep starring in the little story of us? Or do we want to join the cast of this huge story of God? So if you're ready, here we go. In the very first verse of the Bible, it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and here is where this creation story starts. But let me make this clear. This is not where the story of God begins. This is where the creation story begins. And the story of God does not have a beginning. And I could spend a whole lot of time on that, but honestly, I can't explain it <laughs> any more than that. Uh, that God did not have a beginning. And if you're saying, wait a minute, <laughs> that makes my brain hurt. You know, how do you have something? I would just smile and say, join the crowd. Okay, it makes all of our brains hurt. And, and while we're here, let me just tell you something else about the story of God. Not only does the story of God not have a beginning, the story of God is the only story that never ends. It never ends. I mean, look at the back of your Bible. It doesn't say the end. I mean, God's story has no beginning and his story has no end. So are, are you beginning to realize just how massive this story is? And, and so that's why we want to get into this story. And like I said, we're going to track this uh, through the summer. Um, we don't know about what happened before God decided. We know God was already there, but we don't know what happened before he decided to start the creation story. But when he begins the creation story, he begins it with these words, in the beginning. In the beginning, it means in the beginning of the creation story. In the beginning of our part of this huge story that was already going on. In the beginning, God. And we can step into some debates at this point, and we can get into philosophy, and we can try and go real deep here, and, and you know, honestly, I'm up for that, and all that kind of thing. But I think it's much more simple than that. And here's what I've learned, and this is important, is in the beginning of our creation story, there was God. In the beginning of our creation story, there was God. And I've found that if you nail that down, everything else makes a little more sense. Makes a little more sense. The writer of Genesis goes on and says this, Now the earth was formless and empty. This was in the beginning of that creation story. The earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning and that was the first day. Now this is how you make a world in case you ever need to. On the first day, you separate darkness from light, okay? There was no light before. Remember the verse before just said it was darkness. Everything was darkness. And so, so he's going to create light. Uh, and, and by the way, by definition then, darkness is simply the absence of light. Darkness is simply the absence of light. In our culture, in your life, Darkness is the absence of, of light. So on the very first day, God separated from the, the light from the darkness. And you say, is that all he did on the first day? And I would say, let's see you separate light from darkness and see what you can do with the rest of, of your time. But uh, so anyway, so, so he goes on and, and he says, we're going to separate the waters above from the waters below. In other words, the atmosphere, clouds, that's, we know those are water. So from, from the waters below. And that was all that he did on the second day of, of this creation story. And then you can go on down and we put it up there on the screen. Uh, on day three, the lands and the seas were separated. Plants and trees were, uh, were, were placed there. Uh, the sun and moon and the stars on the fourth day, day five, fish and birds, day six, land animals. And then we get to the moment I want to get to, because here's where you and I come in. This is the key moment. It happens on the sixth day of creation. And I want you to listen to how the writer words it. He says, then God said, let us. Now, who is, who is the us? This is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We know that they're all at creation, 
all right? Uh, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all of the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in His image. In the image of, of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. So now into this creation story, God invites man and woman. And by the way, did you notice he made us on the sixth day and not the first day? I mean, you would think that he would have wanted us there on the first day so that we could help him and show him how to make the stuff and, and, and you know, teach him, you know, here's what you need to do. Uh, that's something we seem to be real good at is helping God, you, you know, you know, along the way here. We think we can handle this, and surely God can't, so obviously we have to help Him, but I think the first lesson today is that He didn't need us to do any of this, all right? But on the sixth day after everything has been made, and again, the writer writes it in this way, and I've had people say, do you really? I don't know. I wasn't there, okay? But, but, but the writer says that God simply scoops up some dust, and He presses it together, and He leans in and breathes into this clump of dust, And the Bible says that man became a living soul. And I want you to picture this with me, if you will, that Adam wakes up and and he looks, the first thing he sees is the face of the creator of the universe. I mean, you talk about a wake-up call. The very first thing you ever see in your life is God, all right? And it's not recorded what the conversation between those two was like, but you know I have a weird imagination. So I'm thinking maybe God says, welcome to my story, you know? And Adam starts looking around and he sees flowers and he sees trees and he sees animals and birds and sun and stars. Can you even imagine what that was like? So several years ago when we were in the Keys, we went, uh, I went snuba diving, not scuba diving, but snuba diving. And what they actually do, they put a, um, a raft up on top of the water and they put the air tank here. And so you don't have to have the tank on your back. And, and they have this about 50 foot hose that runs down to a regulator. So you don't have to be trained. All you have to do is, is breathe. And, and they took us out to one of the, the reefs there in the Keys. And of course, I'm just looking at water, you know, blue sky or, or blue sky, green water, you know, all this kind of thing. And, and, and they, uh, they put weights around your waist and, and, and you drop down for the first time. And they say, just drop down and wait for about five or 10 seconds and come back up. And I found out why, uh, because boom, all of those colors hit you at once. And I mean, it's just like overload for your brain. You, you know, you just kind of catches your breath and you really have to get back up before you can go back down again. So can you imagine again, Adam opens his eyes and he sees the creator of the universe and then just boom, all of this, this stuff, all of the the trees and the animals and the sun and the stars and all of these kinds of things. And, And again, I don't know what that conversation was like, but maybe Adam said something like, wow, (laughs) <laughs> and God just smiled and said, tell me about it, you, you know? And, and the story of creation is only six days long, and, and we humans only get on it at the end, and it didn't start with us, and we're not the first thing God made. And God didn't need us to make anything, and He didn't need us giving Him advice or any kind of help. He did it all by Himself. And then this, this amazing thing happens. The writer says that God puts Adam to sleep because he's not done yet. He says there's still one thing that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. And when Adam wakes up the second time, Eve is standing there. And again, I have no idea what Adam said. I think it was probably this. Whoa, man. Whoa, man. (laughs) We need a drummer today. I mean, uh, gosh. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, and she was better looking than any of those animals he had seen before, okay? And she was way better looking than those trees and plants and all this kind of thing. She's perfect for him. And now if I'm Adam, I'm thinking, God, put me to sleep again. Because the first time Adam woke up, he saw God. The second time he woke up, he saw someone that was perfect for him, Eve. You know, and he's probably thinking, waking up is pretty cool. You know, this is a pretty good thing. And by the way, little 30-second sermon here, ladies, You were not around when God made man. Guys, you were asleep when God made women. He did not ask for our advice on how the other one should be put together. All right? God did not put us on earth and make us so different so we could spend all of our time 24-7 trying to fix each other. He didn't do that. Okay? That's his job. So now Adam and Eve are in the middle of this beautiful creation of God, and they look around and they say, God made all of this just for us. 
And that sounds exactly like what a lot of people think, that this world was made for them and that this world kind of revolves around them, but they're wrong. Scripture tells us that God made all of this, the garden, the world, the universe, all of creation, man and woman, not for us, but for himself. Everything that we see, you and I were made for God. I like to say that we were made on purpose for a purpose. And we read in the Scriptures where the psalmist writes words like this. He said, praise him, sun and moon and stars. And we read in the scriptures, the the heavens are declaring the the glory of God. And we read in the scriptures, the trees of the field clap their hands and they break forth with songs of joy. Listen to me, every ocean wave is an affirmation of praise to God. Every bird that sings is an echo of the heart of God. All of creation, the, the sun, the universe beyond, all of creation gives glory to the one who made it. Creation knows that the story is not about creation. Creation knows it's the story of God. And every day our creation pours out its praise to God. So anyway, back to Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve think, wow, God, you made all of this just for us. And he says, no, but I would love for you to enjoy it. And I'd like for you to take care of it. That's what it means to rule over it, take care of it. You see, Adam and Eve, you have a part to play in my story. You're not just over here on the side, one of the animals or something like that. You have a part to play. And I don't want you to just wander around this story with no purpose. I'm going to give you something to do. I'm going to give you a role to play in the story of God. And it begins to unfold here in this first chapter of Genesis. It goes on and says, God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over, take care of. Uh, the, the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so it was. So you have woman and man being created in the image of God to show that they were made by and for God. And he was happy that they were in the story. So he gives them a place in the story. God says, listen, enjoy this. Okay, it's mine, but enjoy it. I want you to multiply. Take care of everything I have. I'm giving you this responsibility. I want you to have a place in my story. And the writer concludes what we call the first chapter of Genesis by saying this, and God saw all that he made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. All right? So, what happens next? Well, they get to the seventh day. Now, God had told them what he wants them to do. All right? We get to the seventh day, and they get up, and they say, what are we going to do now? And God says, well, today we're going to rest. But they hadn't done anything. They hadn't done anything. I mean, think about it. They had not done a thing yet, but look around. I think God was letting them know that his intention for them was not to be so busy running around here and there, and got to do this, and got to do that. They were so busy running around that they couldn't, couldn't take care of the things that he's blessed us with, okay? They need to take care of themselves. That was what was really important. So I think God is teaching us priorities from the very beginning of his story. And here's the bottom line today. I like to say, if you don't get anything else, get this sentence. God wanted them to learn this from the very beginning. He wanted them to learn to listen for him, And he wanted them to learn to listen to him, to him. And here's why. Because very soon, Adam and Eve were going to hear another voice, another voice, a voice that's going to say to them, why are you settling for this small role in God's big story when you could be the whole story, when it could be all about you? Why would you settle? Do you get it? That's what they were deceived by. And you know what? That same voice says the same thing to us today. Why why are you settling for this story? It's it's all about you. You know, it's all about you. It still deceives us today. And Adam and Eve thought, well, if we eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we'll become like God. We'll become like God. And, And forget about taking care of all the animals and the plants and managing the earth and resting and enjoying all of the... Uh, our part in the story of God, we can be the star. We can do it our way. We can decide for ourselves what's best. That's what we want. 
And, and, and people today, you know, I guess they figure I'm, I'm really, really smart or have a lot of wisdom because people say, you're a pastor. Why is everything in the world so messed up? Right there. Right there. Because a couple of people and all of us down through the ages have said, hey, this is our story. We get to decide. We don't have to listen to what anyone else says. So they disobeyed God. And the scriptures tell us at the moment that they knew what God had said and they chose to listen to the voice of the enemy, that they died spiritually, which means they broke that relationship that they had with God. All of those conversations that I imagined, that was over. In fact, we know that they begin to hide from God. They don't even want to see Him, all right? And they're gonna, they died spiritually and they were separated by their sin from God, from a loving Heavenly Father who had only given them the best. And the history of man and woman and the history that you and I are a part of is the story of men and women trading out the opportunity to play a role in God's story for the chance of starring in their own little bitty story. I read this morning a quote from C.S. Lewis. He said, human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God that will make him happy. And a good explanation for the way things are today is that we're surrounded by a bunch of little stories. And all these lines are unfolding and they're all getting twisted and tangled and a lot of little stars and in the middle of them, you know, little stars running around saying, hey, it's my life. I'm the star, look at me. I'm not only the star, I'm the director. I'm the producer. I write the script. I decide who's in. I decide who's out. It's about me and mine. I'm the central character in this story of me. This is my kingdom and I get to decide how things are going to be. But the problem with that, with that is that everyone's story is just a tiny story. And while my story and while your story may draw some interest, and while our stories may draw a crowd for a little while, one day the applause will fade, one day the lights will dim, and our stories will end, and they'll be over. But the good news for all of us through Scripture is, is that through Jesus Christ, that God is in the business of reversing and restoring everything that happened in the beginning. And he's in the business today of inviting people, inviting you guys watching and you guys that are here on campus. He's in the business today of inviting people to trade in their little stories and trade in their lesser fame to have a role in the never-ending great big story of God. And you and I have a choice today. We can walk out of this place and say, no, I'm going to go ahead and star and direct and produce the story of me. And I sure hope that everything turns out all right in the end of the story. Or you can walk out of here today and say, you know what? I trust what God has said. And I want to find my place in his big story, one that will never end. That's your choice. And I would urge you to choose wisely. We're going to leave off from there. We're going to pick up. So everything's a mess, and we're going to see what happens next week. What happens when there's a big, giant mess? What's the first thing you have to do as we, can, as we finish next week in the never-ending story? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. Thankful for the opportunity for each one that's here. I've met some new folks, uh, seen some folks haven't seen in a while, and uh, just good to see our, our regular church family. Um, God, we're all here for a purpose. You brought us all here to hear this message. I needed to hear this today. I needed to be reminded that it's not all about me, but that you've invited me to play a role in your big story. And the reason why I'm here on this earth is to find that role and to perform it to your good pleasure. So Father, we ask that that would be the heart's desire of all of us. And uh, God, we, we, we don't always get it right, but you're in the business of restoring and you're in the, you're in the business of bringing back. God, we're thankful for your forgiveness. We're thankful for your patience with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. It's not my life to live. It's not my song to sing. And all I have is yours For all the time in me 
is not my righteousness. It's not my faithfulness. And all I have is this. We're all eternity. Still in my defense 